Well, good evening, everyone. I want to welcome you to our Wednesday night Bible study. Everybody having a good week this week so far? All three of you, huh? They're having a good week? All right. All right. Well, hope the rest of you can get in here and join in tonight and have a great time. It's always a, a great privilege to get to come back together on Wednesday night, and we appreciate you being here. And uh, we're excited tonight because we're going to have a, a, a new speaker. I'll talk to you about him in just a minute. But I want to welcome our Facebook viewers. We uh, always enjoy having you tune in. We've been seeing a lot more of you tuning in on Wednesday night with us. And, and uh, again, like I said, any of these services that you uh, want to go back and review, you can go back and see them again. And that's the nice thing about having this. So we want to welcome you. If you have any prayer needs tonight on Facebook, we encourage you. Uh, just as soon as I get through introducing the speaker and praying, I'll be back on my phone and I'll be there there to uh, welcome any prayer needs. So if you have needs tonight, we encourage you to get on there and put them on there. So everybody ready to have a good time in the Lord tonight? All right. Amen. Amen. Well, <clears throat> Pastor JP called me, oh, I guess maybe about uh, been close to a month ago and uh, said, uh, I've got a, a unique man I want you to uh, meet and, and love for him to come speak on a Wednesday night. And uh, tonight was my first chance to get a chance to meet. Uh, we're going to be looking at uh, Brother Alan Bailey, and we're excited about having him. He's uh, He's been a missionary in, in Haiti and different places. I'm not going to spoil everything. I'll let him get up here and tell all about what he wants to share with you tonight. And so just sound like a ministry a man that's got a heart after ministry, and we're always excited to hear somebody new. Aren't you glad to hear, hear somebody new tonight? Amen. And so we're just, uh, last couple, two or three times, we've had some new speakers. They've come in and just done a fantastic job. And so we just want you to feel welcome and at home tonight and just enjoy yourself. So let's just open up with a word of prayer. And, Brother Alan, I'm going to get you to just come on here. And, and as soon as I get through praying, you can go ahead and open up service any way the Lord leads. So, Father, tonight we just want to encourage, Father, uh, each of us tonight to open up our hearts we just want to thank you and, and love you tonight, and we receive, Father, what it is you want from, to, for us to hear. God, I pray over our brother tonight. I ask you in Jesus' name that, Father, you would anoint him to speak the words that come from your heart. God, I thank you for the ministry. I, I, I'm excited to hear what, what all the different things that you're using him. God, I, all these new things he was even talking about, I'm sure he'll share those. But Lord, I just ask that you put your hand and your blessing upon him and upon the ministry and on the works that he's doing, God. And we know tonight, Lord, that we can always learn something new. Lord, we're asking for fresh manna tonight. We're asking you to do something new in our heart. Lord, we welcome you, Holy Spirit, to come and fill this place and fill this room with your presence tonight, Lord, and fill each of our hearts to overflowing. And God, we just welcome you, Lord Jesus. You are. We thank you for being Lord of this service, and we give you the glory and the honor and praise for all of it that you're going to do tonight in our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Can we give him a big hand and welcome him tonight? All right. Good evening. Uh, this is fun and exciting for me. Uh, I've never uh, got to speak here at Summit, and uh, I'm just getting introduced to the ministries here and to the church itself. What an awesome facility the Lord has blessed y'all with. Uh, if you don't recognize that or if you're that spoiled, uh, this is awesome. And uh, so it's just such an honor to be here with you tonight. Uh, as he said, I have been a missionary to Haiti, but that's just a little bit of my story, and we may get into that. Um, I did that for three years. It's been a blessing in my life, and uh, I just miss it every single day. But uh, tonight I've been told to come with a, a word, and uh, so I really feel like I have a word, um, and it's a fresh word. He used a great word. He said that he wanted it to be manna. Um, cause you know, if you know anything about manna, it fell, you were either able to eat it that day or it went bad. And, um, uh, I'll tell you how fresh this word was. I had a completely different word that I was going to bring to you. And this morning during my time of prayer, um, I felt like Holy Spirit said, now I got something different because you're trying to improve something that Jesus already had perfected. And so, uh, you'll feel what I'm saying here in a little bit once you get, uh, into the meat of what we're going to talk about, but I'm going to be coming out, uh, coming to you out of Matthew five. And um, if you know anything about Matthew 5, this is the Sermon on the Mount. This is whenever Jesus is giving uh, his big uh, presentation, I guess, if you will. But um, there's a place here that's, there's, that he says something that's always caught my, uh, my eye, my ear, whenever I would hear it. 
And so if you will, I want you to look with me uh, here where he's talking about salt and light. So that's going to be Matthew 5 and 13 and 14, okay? Uh, if you have your Bible, I'll, I'll give you a second to get there with me. But here's he, Jesus, he's, he's always talked in these stories so people that could understand. And um, I've always loved that about Jesus. I don't know if you love that about Jesus, but I love that about Jesus is he always put the corn down where the animals could get to it or the hay where the cows could get at it. If you know that farming term, uh, sometimes there's these places where you put hay in, and if you don't shake it, if you don't jiggle it enough, the hay stays up top whenever it needs to be down bottom where the animals can get to it. And Jesus always made sure he put it down there where everybody could get to it. And uh, as a missionary in Haiti, one of the things I always had to do was make sure that it wasn't a very complex message. It was a very simple message, and this is the message. Jesus loves sinners. For real. Like, there's nothing else. There's no other strings. Jesus loves sinners. He loves us all. And uh, doesn't love me more, doesn't love you less. Jesus loves sinners. That's the simple message, and that's the real message, and that's the only message, is that he loves sinners. And we need to get that out. And so here... In Matthew 5, Jesus is saying, hey, I want to tell you two things that you are. You're salt and you're light. Okay, so I'm talking to you about being an effective witness in the marketplace. That's my official topic tonight for you note takers, if you want to put that at the top of your notes tonight. Being an effective witness in the marketplace. That's the official term and uh, topic tonight. Be salt. Be light. Okay, I'm done. That's it. Seriously, it's that simple. Jesus said, look, you are the salt of the earth. But what good is salt once it loses its flavor? You throw it on the path and it's trampled. Now, if you know anything about salt, salt does three things. Salt brings flavor to things. Salt will melt things, if you throw it down on a path that melts ice for all of my snowbird friends in the audience, and then it also cures. Now, see, we always like to think about our flavor. We like to think about how we can be so uh, hot in the spirit that we can melt the coldest hearts, but we don't ever think that maybe God has brought us into a place to cure something, to preserve something. Salt cures. And he says, you're the salt of the earth, but you're not any good. If you lose your flavor, we're just going to throw you in the path. We're going to trample on it. And then he says, you're the light of the world, a city on a hill that cannot be hidden. Man, who takes a, 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 a lamp and puts it underneath a bushel? No, you put it on a lampstand so everyone in the house can see. And so likewise, let your light shine so that all men can see to bring glory to your Father in heaven. That's what he says for the rest of that passage. I'm paraphrasing, but I'm real close. So check this out. He gives you this model. He says, do you want to be the light of the world? Well, start in your city on a hill. As a matter of fact, not just there, start in your house by letting your light shine on the lampstand so that everybody in your house can see your light. Then you can let your light shine to all men so that the world can see. He takes it down. He says, world level responsibility, city level responsibility, home levels of responsibility. And he says, let your individual level responsibility light shine. He takes it from being the light of the world to being a city on a hill to being a light in your house to being your individual light so that all men can see your light so it brings glory to your Father in heaven. You feel that? That's how you be an effective witness in the marketplace. You let your light shine so that all men see so that it brings glory to heaven. And you don't worry about the world or the city because if you do that in your home, it becomes a natural outcome of who you are. See, love isn't what I do. Love is who I am because Jesus doesn't love. He is love. And Jesus loves sinners. See, that's, that's, that's the heart of the gospel. And if you don't feel that heart of the gospel, then the gospel's never, real been, never really been real to you. Because that idea of Jesus loving me has to be light in my life that shines so that all men can see. Because if there's not something different about me, then I'm just in monotone. I just look like everything else and it doesn't do any glory to God. Why did Moses shine to the point that he terrified the people whenever he came down off the mountain? 
Because he'd been in the presence of God so much that the glory of God shone off of him and it terrified them. Man, I want to have that kind of glory that whenever I walk into a place, they're like, man, whoa, hold on. What's up, dude? Like, do you want to be to that place with him? So that you, whenever you walk into a place, the atmosphere changes from darkness to light because that's what being a lampstand in your home does. That's how you become that city on a hill. See, a city is a group of individuals who will come together and say, hey, there's something different about us. That's your tribe. That's the people you roll with. I want to be the light of the world. A city on a hill will take it to your home and get your family to all light their lamps first. And then your house is shining. And then you bring it in and you look down your street and you're like, oh man, look, Bob and Sue have got their lights on too. They're shining too. And next thing you know, you're a city on a hill that can't be hidden. That's why community is important for the people who don't think that you need a pastor or a church or a shepherd. No, 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 you're missing it. You got to be a city on a hill. But how do I do this? Now, see, here's where Holy Spirit hit me this morning, okay? Now, maybe you've never had Holy Spirit just roll, just punch you in the gut. Holy Spirit did that to me today. And said, because what I was going to say is, is whenever I'm diff- dealing with a difficult customer at my job, I just go, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And when they're yelling at me, I'm love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And I was going to ad nauseum just keep saying love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, because that's what, literally what I do all day. I'm not joking. I wish I were. I work at a place where the phone never stops ringing. God, thank you for blessing our business with so much business that the phone never stops ringing. But that phone never stops ringing. And I got to have it picked up by the third ring. Because <laughs> I'm in sales. And that's what we do. Oh, and by the way, I've also got to call you and let you know whenever your car's ready because and the bill was higher than it was. Because I'm in sales and that's what I got to do. You see what I'm saying? Like I've got the absolute worst position whenever it happens to dealing great news because I never get to say it except for have a nice day. God bless. But I was going to give you the fruits of the Spirit, and Jesus said, look, cat, go to back to the beginning of the chapter. I've already taught them what to do. It's called the Beatitudes. See, I was going to teach you out of Galatians, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control, which are very important nine characteristics, the fruits of the Spirit. And if you don't know them, I'll teach them to you, and it doesn't take long, as you can tell, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. But these other ones are a little bit harder to learn. They take a little bit more. Because he says, first of all, in verse 5 and 3, he says, Blessed are the poor in spirit. Wow, what an uplifting and positive message for today's. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Now, see, whenever you don't study the word, then you don't know what the words mean. But whenever you see poor in spirit, what it says is, is that, My spirit is so poor compared to the riches of the Spirit of God that it always humbles me. That carries a little bit different weight. It's kind of like he's saying what he's saying in James 4 and 6, right? God opposes the proud, but he extends grace unto the humble. So whenever I see the first beatitude, I immediately think, in my work day, the first thing I need to do is walk in humility. Dude, I don't know you. You don't know me. I don't know what you've been through. I need to just humbly accept that, hey, you're losing your mind for a very valid reason, and I just need to help you through it. (laughs) And so humility and not pride. I do know what size tire your car needs, but I'm going to let you tell me the wrong size four times until you realize that you're wrong because I'm never going to tell you that. But check it out. Whenever I walk in humility and God doesn't oppose me, the kingdom of heaven is mine. I thought that'd be a little bit more exciting because I'm really excited about the kingdom of heaven. Verse 4. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Let me tell you something. If you've never lost anything, you don't know what it feels lost to have loss. See, that's called empathy. 
because I know what you have been through. So I know what it's like to have had a flat tire or a car that's a piece of junk and that it would barely go down the road. I know what that feels like. I can empathize with you. Let me help you through this situation. As I walk in humility before you saying, I'm not better than you just because I'm in a different station of life or season. Because I've just been educated on something that maybe you haven't ever had the opportunity to learn because maybe you never had a father in your life or maybe you never had a mother in your life or maybe you just never had anybody to tell you you don't talk to a woman that way. Period. Because it's stupid. Five, five. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Now, I don't know where we got this definition of meek being a mouse. Oh, I'm just meek. <laughs> Let me tell you what my definition of meek is. Meek is the river. What? What? You can't tell a river where it's going to go. The river just does what a river does. When it rains, it swells. Whenever it's dry, it shrinks. Whenever it goes this way and the current's going that way, it goes this way and then the current goes that way. You don't tell a river what to do. You have to force a river what to do because a river is meek. It doesn't impose its will. It just does its will. What if we all walked in meekness and we just did what we do? See, this is what I do. This is just what I do. This is how I do it. Not everybody likes how I do this, but I like how I do this, and God likes how I do this, so this is how I do it, and this is what I do. I don't have to, I'm not trying to impress you. I'm trying to impart you. I'm not trying to entertain you. I'm trying to enlighten you to what God's trying to get to you. So if you're entertained, I don't care. Great, but I mean, I don't care. Because I want you to get what God has for you because it doesn't matter. You'll forget my name, but if you remember him, it's all worth it. And so meekness is every day I just go into that shop and I'm going to be who I'm going to be. God didn't give a definition. He said, who are you? I am that I am. I always like to say, Jack, don't ask me who I am. It's just who I am. I'm not going to define it because you'd never understand it anyway. That's what God told Moses. You'll never comprehend me. How would I even start to explain myself to you? Well, if I'm created in the image of God, just wait with me here. This will develop, okay? But if I'm created in the image of God, and I'm a carrier of his image, then I should never have to define that image. I just walk in that image. I'm going to leave that with y'all. Five and six. Those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, baby. For they will be filled. Catch this. Righteousness. When you take that word and you break it down from Strong's, it says literally doing justice according to godly standards. Now, what if we all just wanted to do what was just in our workplaces? Not what would get me promoted, sorry. Didn't mean to step on those toes. Not that would make me look better and the other guy look worse. But what if I just did what was just every day toward my coworkers and then to my customers? See, one of the greatest compliments I ever get is whenever somebody comes to me and says, hey, you know, I went to this other blah, 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 blah. And because I'm a single mom or I'm a elderly person or I'm a teen who doesn't know, you know, that cars don't lean like this when you drive them. I mean, <laughs> the greatest compliment somebody can tell me is, hey, man, I really feel like you did me right on this deal, even though it was more than what I expected whenever I walked in. Like, people don't mind paying the value of something. I learned this because I'm in sales. So give it to them at the value, but don't inflate it because you can take advantage. Because as a Christian, Christ follower, whatever the term is today, your testimony 
depends on what people say about you, not about what you say about you. And the worst thing I hate is, man, doesn't that dude go to church with you? Doesn't that dude, isn't that he in your Bible study? Doesn't he volunteer with your kids at the church? What? Why? <laughs> you always worry about those, right? Right? Hey, doesn't so-and-so go, yeah? Why? Oh, they're really great. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. They're really great, yeah. You, you never know what's going to come out of people's mouths. But what about whenever the testimony's not, hey, they're a great guy, but they're, man, like, I just saw him, like, pull out in traffic and jump out of his car and, like, beat, jump on top of his hood. And I was like, you know, that wasn't me, right? I mean, because <laughs> we're all not perfect, so let's not start throwing the stones, right? But we do got to guard our testimony. And I don't think a lot of us do a good job of that in the marketplace, in our workplaces, the places that we're not here the other whatever many hours of the, the week, you know. I mean, some people, those the hours where you're not putting on the mask to make everybody think everything's okay in your life, like the place where it's lo literally hell for you to go to every single day because you hate it. But you have to because bills don't pay themselves. I just want to be just with people. Like for people to honestly say at the end of the deal, hey, he did me right, or he did me as good as he could in the situation that we were in. How about number seven? Blessed are the merciful because they'll receive mercy. Have you ever been able to give somebody mercy in your job place? I see people do it all the time. Every time I go to a checkout and I don't have that exact change because I don't carry, carry coins anymore, and they're like, oh, don't worry, I got that six cents. Get it, six cents. But anyway, they say, here, I got that. Well, I know it may not seem it, but that's mercy. Even in that small amount, that's mercy. I mean, Jesus said even if you get a cu cup of water in his name. So, I mean, just the li don't think about it like that. Think about it the next time you give that kid 25 cents who needs it so that he can get that, you know, thing, piece of candy that he really didn't have the money for, but he came up there and he said, I got a dollar, and he didn't know about taxes, and you say, I got the taxes. Just think about that. That's mercy. And if you show mercy, mercy will be shown to you whenever you need to go to the tax auditor and you say, hey, man, I don't have this money. I don't have that. You know what? We're going to forgive that. I don't know. Just mercy. You don't sow so that you get it, but sometimes you get it because you sow. Do you understand? That's mercy. That's somebody coming in and not having the money for the tire, but me trying to go out there and digging through all the used tires I just pulled off of somebody's car to find one that we can patch just so they can get through to next week so that they can come in and buy the cheapest tire I have. That's mercy. And you know what mercy is literally defined as? <laughs> Everybody raise your hand. Say, I'm okay, I'm okay. To, be blown to be blown away. Say, I'm okay, I'm okay. To, be blown away. to be blown away. When you look up mercy in this instance, it means to conduct your life according to God's covenant. Let that sit for a second. Whenever I conduct my life according to God's covenant, that's mercy. Everybody breathe. That's heavy, right? And that's okay, right? Because I want to be merciful because then I'll be shown mercy. So in other words, that whenever I conduct my life according to God's covenant, with other people than that in situations where they're undeserving of me operating in God's covenant. Do you feel what I'm saying here? That whenever I choose to operate in God's covenant versus what I can do because either I have the authority, the ability, or the authorization, I choose to conduct my life according to God's covenant, and God's covenant is one word, love. Woo! And he doesn't love. He is love. Blessed are the pure in heart, verse 8, for they will see God. I want to see God. I want to see God. I want to see God. Man, I want to see God. 
I want to see him like Isaiah 6, high and on the throne. And I want to see the, the trail of his veil, the, the train of his veil that fills the t robe that fills the temple. And I want to hear the, the, the elders around the throne. And I want to hear the, the four living creatures that are saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Like, I want to see God for real. I want to see him that way. I want to see the feet that, that whenever John the Revelator saw him and they saw the eyes of fire, I want to see God. And it's so odd that it says, to see God, you must be pure. Because I think about those eyes of fire, the eyes of fire, the eyes of fire. And the dross that gets burned in the fire. And purity comes only whenever the refiner can see his reflection in the silver. The fire. See, mm, when the heat at your job turns up and you have the choice <laughs> to go pure or go rogue, stay pure. Keep your intentions pure. Like whenever I, whenever you call me up and you say, hey, I've got this going on with my daughter and I need you to put something on there that my daughter needs. Okay, look, I work at a tire shop, okay? And, and people don't know nothing about tires. I didn't know nothing about tires whenever I started, you know, and I know a lot more, but I'll know not near as much as people who know stuff about tires whenever I don't work there because there's just a lot to know, okay? But whenever you call and you say, hey, what set of tires would you put on your daughter's car? You can be guaranteed the set of tires that I put on your car are going to be the set of tires that weren't best for the shop, that weren't the ones that we had the highest profit margin in, weren't the ones I had on sale or had in overstock. It was the one I'd put on my daughter's call, car because you asked me as a dad what I would do. Keep your intentions pure. Don't sell somebody something they don't need just because you need a, a, the, a, you know, an extra three horsepower on your outboard motor next season. So you're trying to get your sales up so you can get a bonus? Keep your intentions pure. Don't sell that lady a package that she's never going to use for a warranty that's never going to come to pass on a car you sell, car salesman. They're never going to use it. Don't sell it to them if you know that. I'm not dogging used car salesmen. I love them. They're the bulk of my business. I'm just saying, don't sell them something they don't need. Keep your intentions pure. You feel what I'm saying? Because... If I, as a salesperson, can't be trusted that my intentions are pure, then you will never receive me as a subject matter expert. So we're talking about being an effective witness in the marketplace. If you come into my place, I've got to be either the subject matter expert or find you one. Because your life is at stake. I mean, does no one feel that way about their automobile if you're driving it? Right? So, I mean, I take that responsibility big. And so you have to keep my intentions pure. At the end of the day, it's all about the safety of the vehicle. It's not about the sales or anything else because you have to have your intentions pure. In other words, you have to have a standard that can't be broken. Do you have a standard in your life that can't be broken? And I'm not talking about a church standard and a home standard and a business standard because, see, there's only one standard that goes across all of the activities of your life, the secret stuff too. And if it's not the same standard, then it's bogus. And it's fake. Number nine. I hope y'all are getting something out of this because I'm getting a lot out of it. I mean, I'm like, I'm like digging it. But here it is, verse nine. Blessed are the peacemakers. <laughs> For they will be called children of God. Now, if you've never just sat back and said the word shalom, let's do that for a second, okay? So I just want you to take a deep breath in, and as you breathe out, I just want you to go, shalom. Now, see, you don't understand, but you just authorized peace to come into you. And see, peace, according to what I've been taught, is like water that goes into every broken place, every crack and crevice. Like when you say shalom, you confess shalom over your life. God's peace comes in. And it fills every empty spot. It just keeps filling and filling and filling and filling until you finally are there. And then you have shalom. Perfect, unending peace. And it comes every day. You have to 
<laughs> you see what I'm saying? Like you have to do this. But when you are a peacemaker, you're a child of God. Man, <laughs> if that don't set you on fire, your wood is so wet. Because, man, to be recognized as a child of God because I bring peace into somebody's situation. If you've never had a blowout on the side of the road and didn't know how you were going to get back to wherever Louisiana, whenever you're stuck in wherever this is, Alabama, and your kid's got a dance recital tomorrow afternoon that you absolutely positively have to be at, and your tire cannot be found anywhere, let me tell you, you need somebody who can speak some peace. You need somebody who can tell you the things that nobody else can tell you. Well, let me tell you, that's the reason why Jesus was able to do the things he was able to do, because he was able to tell those cats things that nobody else could tell them. They'd come to him with problems, and he would come at them from perspectives that nobody even saw, because he saw it in 360 degrees. They only saw it in their point of view. And that's how Jesus sees every problem that you have. It's in 360 degrees from all different directions. He's not three dimension. He's like 720 dimension. He can see everything from every, from the inside, the outside, the backside, the front side, from the before in history and behind in history and below it in history and above it in history. I'm telling you, it is so cool how God sees history because we see it linear one way forward and he picks it up like these glasses and he looks at it and he, he, he can see it and he knows what it's made of. And that thing that you didn't think mattered 10 years ago, whenever you fast forward and you get to that place in 10 years, and you're like, whoa. I'm in the seasons of those, whoa, because I'm starting to see this. But you get to speak peace into people's lives whenever you understand that you serve the God of all creation and that whenever you speak, he listens. And whenever you say things and you say yes, and he agrees with it according to his will, it happens. He can make things move. I'm telling you, just with his mouth, you don't believe me, go read that first book in the Bible because it talks all about him talking and things happening. And if I'm created in his image, whenever I speak, things happen. I'm just saying. It's the way it works. You don't have to believe me for me to be right. Um, <laughs> blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Oh, come on now. I read that, and you know what immediately jumped up in my spirit? Integrity. Man, I know some people with integrity who get persecuted on a daily because of what they believe and what they stand up for. In the workplace? On the assembly line? Because, see, it's a lot easier to go with the flow at work. Trust me. I've laughed at inappropriate things, not even meaning to, but just not wanting to be out of place. And then I'd be like, Lord, why? what? Hold on. And I walked right back out and I was like, hey, guys, that wasn't even funny to me. I just want to let you know that. I mean, it was, but I can't let it be funny to me because uh, shut up. But at least I tried to protect it. You know what I'm saying? And, and, and that's the best you can do some days is just try to protect it. Because um, I, I spoke in this other message about how the definition of sin that's found in Genesis, that, the, that according to Hebrew, actually is the word het. And it's like um, to go astray. Like whenever you're drawing back an arrow and the arrow goes astray. So like every day you're continually trying not to sin because you're pulling back and you're trying and practice makes perfect, right? So you just keep trying until you get it right. And some days you get it right. But most days you miss it by something. But you keep on trying because that's what you do, right? And so, man, I can be all about that righteous flow and have my integrity. In other words, that if I tell you something and you come back in and you check me on it, I'm going to stand by what I said, even if it's going to wind up costing me money. <clears throat> Louder for those up top. Even if it winds up costing me money. Not my business owner. Not my fellow employee, but if it costs me money. Like, hey, I'm going to help you do this. I'm going to make sure we take care of you. And then I go to my, oh, no, we ain't doing that. Mm. Uh, you sure? No. Mm. All right, let's see what we can work out here. Um, 
And then I kind of go into Michael Scott mode, you know, I can't give you the laptop, but I can give you a case for the laptop. So let's see what we can do here. You know, I'm trying to work with them, trying to help them get them out of their situation. But because, because my integrity matters to me, like it really does. Because if I tell you something, you've got to be able to bet on that. Like, you've got to be bet on that. Because, like, in a lot of cases, whenever I give somebody my word, like, their family's riding on that to, like, Orlando for vacation the next day. Yeah, your breaks are good. <laughs> Just never try to stop and you'll be fine. You'll get there faster, I promise. How much is your integrity worth? Is it worth that bonus so that you can get that deal? Is it worth that one jerk client that you have to take all those places that you know that you don't want to take them just so that you can get the deal? Is it the lies that you have to tell your wife so that you can actually go and do the business that you think you need to do instead of doing it God's way? I'm just throwing some stuff out there, okay, because it's real. Because my integrity is actually worth something. My integrity is actually worth a lot of fights with my wife. Ask her. She's right back there. She'll tell you. Like, I'll say things, and then I have to back them up. And she's like, why you got to go out now? Because I said I would. And I do. You know, I tell you, you can call me at midnight, and I'll be there for you. Call me at midnight. I'll be there. I'll be on the phone in the other room at 3 a.m., talking to your kid for three hours so he doesn't commit suicide on the streets of Birmingham. I'll do that because I said I would. I mean, no, 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 no. Don't clap that because that's real. That's really something that I do. I don't need clapping for it because the reward was the kid didn't kill himself. So I'm good with that, okay? And God's even better with it. I just use it as an example. Like we really got to stick by those words because sometimes people are really counting on those words that you throw out there. And there's so many people in ministry that have made promises they didn't keep. And then we wonder why when we make promises in the marketplace and we say we're a Christian, people are like, whatever. Like, I'm tired of that. I'm, I'm tired of that. Like Paul, he wrote, he said, like, no, don't even look at that example that Christ gives you. Look at my example because my example is going to be so good you never even got to look at Christ, baby, because I'm going to be gold. What if we lived our lives like that? Like, I want to be the example that people look up to. Well, because we're worried about people examining our lives. I get it. 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 Because it goes back to church hurting and church. And it goes around this circle and people hurt people. We're going to hurt people, hurt people. And I get it. But at some point, you've got to decide I want to be light more than I want to be hurt. At some point, you've got to say I want to be salt more than I want to be hurt. I want to be healed more than I want to be hurt. I want to be whole more than I want to be hurt. I want to be complete more than I want to be broken because some people walk around in this thing of being broken and they never get to the place of brokenness. And there's a difference. Broken says I need to be fixed and brokenness says I am broken before you, God. I'll never be fixed and the only way I am is if you perfect me. Amen. That's brokenness. And when we walk in this place where all we want to do is make sure our integrity stays there. We can recognize when somebody's walking in broken but can walk out brokenness. I see it all the time. See a broken person walk in, have a conversation, they walk out in brokenness and they're complete because whatever was on them is off of them. We got to do that. And you can do it right where you're at without freaking people out too. You really can. Here's the last one. And this is how I'm going to tell you. You can do this without freaking people out, okay? Blessed are you <laughs> when people revile you, persecute you, and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. See, because whenever you take that stand in the workplace, you're going to need to hold on to that last one. Because, man, every joke by every Joe is going to come out. They're going to talk about your walk, about your talk, about what you used to do, about what you still do, about how you slipped up the other day whenever you hit your hand with a hammer. They're watching. They're going to be looking at you, and they're going to just tell you, yeah, yeah, big Jesus boy, yeah, yeah, look at you, look at you. And if you go in there week one, guns are blazing, Jesus on your mind, telling everybody about it, throwing out the gospel tracts everywhere. 
Put in your Bible where they'll see it. You're going to burn them out, and they're going to be over with you quick. And then whenever you slack off, they're going to say, what happened? Lose your fire? But what if we did this? What if we were just consistent? What if we just became a city on a hill? What if we were the light of the world and the city on a hill and that we took our light into our homes so that our family would see it? You feel where I'm saying? And let our light shine so all men can see. Then we would bring glory to our Father in heaven. See, instead of putting the Jesus fish on our business, why didn't we put the Jesus fish tattooed on our hearts? Take away our, our hearts of stone, give us hearts of flesh, and then whenever we deal with people, we say, how would Jesus handle this idiot in front of me? And then you say, Holy Spirit, forgive me. No, no, I meant the idiot in front of me, but well, yeah. Okay. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. And then you humbly come to him. You can speak in authority, but be in meekness. Hey, I really do know what I'm talking about, and I'm here for your best interest. A lot of times I'll tell people, I'm your advocate on this side of the phone. I'm the person representing you to the mechanic, to the tire tech. You tell me what you want them to know, and I'll tell them, and I'll defend it for you. No, it really is squeaking, she said. But if we want to be salt and light, if we want to be the light of the world in a city on a hill that can't be hidden, then we really do need to make this something personal and individual to each one of us. We need to let our lamp be on the lampstand in our homes, but in our workplaces. Because, see, I think a city on a hill is also illuminated with businesses because, see, the homes aren't the only thing in a city. Matter of fact, cities are defined by businesses. It's a place where business happens. A city is a place where commerce and business happens. So I think that's one of the reasons why the translation says city and not village or town. It's a city on the hill. In other words, it's a metropolis. It's a big deal. It's not just homes. It's businesses. Hey, so Christian businessmen who think that you have missed the call of God in your life because you're out there and you're turning a wrench or you're, cre you're fixing ACs or you're doing whatever it is that God has called you and gifted you to do as a king in the kingdom of, let me free you from the notion that the only place you can serve is up here on the pulpit. Because I promise you, every day in your place, as that guy who doesn't know the Lord is looking at your life, you're ministering. Every time that single mother doesn't know how she's going to pay the bill, but she sees you, lady who's in her place all the time, she just knows there's something about you, one day she's going to say, hey, I don't know what it is, but can I talk to you for a second? Because I see you, and I've seen you for a while, and there's something there, and I just need to know, i got this going on in my life, and is there any way you can help me? And Holy Spirit's going to pop that, and then you'll have that opportunity. But if you don't let your light shine so that all men can see, glory is never given to your Father in heaven. See, God's a God of process. He shows us things all the time. And when Jesus was talking to these parables of people on the Temple of the Mount, uh, on the, uh, at the parable uh, here at the Sermon on the Mount, he's showing them the big picture. Hey, if you want to be the light of the world, be a city on the hill. And it starts in your home individually with you. That way, if you'll just focus on shining so that everyone who meets you, all men see, so that all men can see. So if you'll just focus on every person you meet personally, don't worry about streaming, don't worry about, you know, being on Twitch or any of the other stuff, just the people you meet on a daily basis. I'm just talking real simple, okay? We're talking about like before first century stuff, okay? Jesus, okay? He's just saying just to the people that you meet, if you'll just be light so that all men can see then you'll bring glory to your Father in heaven. Amen. Now, sometimes that glory that you bring to your Father in heaven will come back down to you, and then you'll realize, hey, I'm supposed to do this to more pe for more people, and, and you'll get vision, you know? We, we, we've, we're starting an organization, and it's called Hope Like a Virus. And the, the, it's real simple. Here's our creed. Do good everywhere, always. That's it. If we would just focus on doing what Jesus told us to do, <laughs> literally, if we would just do what he said, and that's it, we'd be okay. 
The world would be okay, I promise you. Like, we wouldn't have to have all the other junk, but we would just do what he says. And it was real simple. Whenever they asked him what the most important commandment was, what did he come back to him with? The Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord our God is one. You should love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, and every fiber of your being. And then he added something to it because that's how Jesus was. He did it to Passover, and he does it here. And he says, and equally as important, you should love your neighbor as yourself. That's where we mess it up because none of us know how to love ourselves, so we don't know how to love our neighbors. Because we know who we are when we turn off the lights and we go to bed. And that's why we can't let our light shine for all men to see, because we can't see it. And that's messed up. I hate sitting in the dark by myself. And I bet a lot of you have done it. In your car, after you drop your kids off at school, sitting in your car, making that hard decision to go on into work or to go somewhere else. Anywhere else, but there, or home. See, you don't have to sit in the dark because Jesus is there with you. And I don't know how this just became an evangelistic message, but it did. And if you've been sitting in the dark, Jesus wants you out of the dark. And he don't care what kind of sinner you are. He just wants you out of the dark. He'll figure all that out. We don't have to. Really, for real, we don't have to, okay? Like, he's got it, I promise. But like, if you don't know Jesus, he totally wants you to. And he's been dying your entire life. Literally, he died for you. I mean, seriously, he's dying to meet you. And has been. But your entire life, he's been waiting to meet you. And I, and I just think that I won't be light in this moment if I don't share that with you. That there is an uncreated God who loves you so much that he not only sent his son for you, but he didn't send him to condemn you, but to free you through his life. That's what John 3, 16, 17 is about, is that if you'll just believe in him, he doesn't condemn you. He brings you in. And see, in a world where everybody's telling me what's wrong with me, I just want somebody to bring me in. And Jesus wants to totally bring you into what he's about. And that's why we're saying hope like a virus, because Jesus is hope, and I want him to spread like a virus. Man, if we can be scared of a pandemic, we need to be about Jesus spreading. And that's real. And so here, in this moment, if you want to be an effective witness in your marketplace, and your marketplace is the whether you're a nurse or a doctor, or you turn a wrench, or you're at a sales cashier spot doing retail for every tourist that comes to Tanger, like, if that's you, try to figure out what that person on the other side of the register or the other side of the issue needs. Because I guarantee you, it's Jesus. Whatever the issue is, it's Jesus. That's the great thing about this thing we walk in. There's only one answer to any problem. That's why he said, I am, because he could be anything you needed him to be. And so... To be an effective witness in the marketplace, focus on your lampstand. It starts with you. It starts with a conscious decision every day of how you're going to operate with people. Are you going to choose to walk in that humility, that meekness, that empathy for people's situation? Are you going to be somebody who's going to be a peacemaker? Are you going to speak pe peace or chaos into someone's situation? Are you going to thirst and hunger for righteousness? Are you going to do things with pure intentions? Are you going to worry about your integrity? Are you going to stand up for your faith? That's how you let your light shine for all men to see so that glory is brought to your Father in heaven. I appreciate so much your time and your attention. And you know what? God loves every single one of you with a love that you'll never understand, but you can try. And I hope that you walk in that knowledge and that this word sits and it just kind of rests on you. And next time you have an opportunity to operate in, in one of the Beatitudes, that you really kind of take this heart and say, oh, this is what that cat was talking about that Wednesday night. Because that's all I really want is just at some point it pops up and says, oh, okay, that's what he meant. Because then that means you had a God moment, and that's cool. So uh, I'm done. So if you want to come back up here, I'm good.
I bet Adam's in the house. All right. Yeah. Man, wasn't that good? Oh, praise the Lord. You know, one thing, you know, of course, I mean, I, I appreciate Brother Allen because he's in the service right position like I am, at, you know. And, it, it, you know, sometimes you're tested. Well, let's say this. A lot of time when we when we come into the building, everybody on Sunday morning, let's just be honest, is probably on their best behavior. They're coming in with smiles on their face. But when you meet them on Monday morning, it's a whole nother world. Do you understand what I'm saying? That same person that smiled and loved you will, will want to hate you in Jesus' name, you know, it, because you tell them some bad news about their car or whatever. In other words, the rubber meets the road, as he was saying tonight, in the workplace. Are you following what I'm saying? That's where the real you can come out. That's where the real you gets out there, and that's where people see. You know, he, he said something reminding me that this week I had a I had a little young lady, one of our parts lady, kept coming in, and, and, and the Lord kept speaking in my heart to speak a word to her. I didn't even know what I was going to say to her. And I, and I just finally I looked at her and I said, I just want you to know that I, God, want, he's telling me something about you. He hadn't even told me what it is, but I know the minute I start speaking to you here, he's going to share with me what it is that you need. And I started sharing with her, and first thing you know, she's tearing up and she's crying. And, oh, my gosh, I didn't, how did you know all that stuff? Well, anyway, I started talking to her, and, and bless her heart, she had, she had been hurt at church and, and, and just saw the hypocrisy and all the stuff, and she was looking for something real. And she came back this week, and she told me, she said, I went back to church for the first time in a long time. And she said, before I walked out of the door, I was crying and weeping. It was so good to be back in God's presence again. You see, I probably would have never gotten a chance to witness to her if I hadn't been in the workplace because that's where she was. It, it, he says, you, you cannot believe the desperation that walks in our door. I, my car's broke. I don't know what I'm going to do. I have no food. I, I, I have no money. It, and, and it gives us an opportunity. I get to witness more in the workplace than I ever have worked or witnessed in the church. Are you following what I'm getting at? God has put you out there. Don't be ashamed of what you're doing. See, for a long time, I kept thinking, well, I don't stand this, God. I'm a pastor. Why in the world am I out here working over here in a business, greeting people every day? Because you know why? Because I can pastor more probably in that repair business than I can in the church. And I can be there more. He's a, he's, that's why God has put Brother Allen up here in sweat tire. I sell tires too, brother. I know. I sell, uh, I sell repairs. And it's hard when you come in and a guy comes in thinking two or $300 is going to fix his car. And $1,000 later, you still ain't found the problem. You, you understand where I'm going? At? And he's got, oh, my God, what am I going to do? How am I going to do this? Brother, don't worry. We're going to help you out. We're going to do whatever it takes. Sometimes I have to cut the labor to nothing. And just say, you know what, we're not going to make any on this job because we want, I want to help you out. That's the kind of thing that we can do and have integrity on the job. You can help people in every position. Brother, I appreciate this message tonight. I tell you what, it helped me. It, it, it really did. It made me appreciate... It made me appreciate the fact, because I have asked God many times, why am I here, Lord? And I keep getting reminded over and over and over and over. Son, you're out here where the people are. You're out here where the, where the people are hurting. People are dying, and they're hurting. I heard him say something here a while ago. He said, some of you, and I'm gonna, I want to I wanna close with this. And I, I, to, if we go past our Facebook, I want to thank all our Facebook people from tuning in tonight. But I want you, everybody to stand here together as we close. You know, he, he made an opportunity to say something tonight. And David, if you can put on some music back there just real softly. But I, w I, want you to, I want you to think about this. If you are in that dark place in your life, I don't want to leave this place without giving you an invitation to let Jesus get you out of that dark place. Because, see, that's where the rubber meets the road. Or maybe you're here tonight and you said, you know what? My witness, because there's been times, there's been times the phone would ring and it would be somebody I know is fixing to call and fuss and I'd want to go, ah, I don't want to talk to you. I'm tired of this phone. I want to slam it. And you pick up your performance auto. Can I help you? But, see, God, maybe you've been in that place that your witness hasn't been very strong. Or maybe you've fallen in that dark side at work and you've gotten into a pattern that you feel like is not bringing Jesus glory. I want to be able to bring Jesus glory wherever I am. That's where my heart is. God, 
I pray that when I walk out of a business, that when I come into a place or when I walk into a restaurant or when I go into a place, people can feel the presence of the Lord walking with me. I don't want Jesus to have to be ashamed of the way I act during the week. And maybe that's where you've been. Maybe you're in that place right now and you're saying to yourself, Brother Don, that message really spoke to me tonight. I want us to close our eyes just for a minute. If you're here tonight and you've, you've said, man, I'm in that dark place. First of all, I want to deal with this. You're in that, I'm in that dark place, but I know Jesus is knocking at my door and he's speaking to me tonight. And I want Jesus to come into my life and change that place I'm in. Would you just raise your hand, slip your hand up where you are. Don't be ashamed. Hands, oh man, hands going up everywhere. Hands are going up everywhere. Thank you, Lord. I want you to pray this prayer tonight, and I want it to come from your heart. I can't change anything in your life, but Jesus can change everything. And if you truly mean what you're saying tonight, and let me, let me tell you, sometimes I think we say things too lightly. If you really, truly mean what you're saying tonight, Jesus will change your life. I want you to pray this prayer, and I want everybody else to help them here tonight, okay? Let's just let's pray with them here tonight. I want you to pray this prayer, Lord Jesus. I've been in a dark place in my life. I'm in it now. But I know you can deliver me. And I'm asking you tonight, Lord, come down here and get me, Lord. Rescue me. Save me. Forgive me of my sins. Pick me out of this dark place, Lord. And Lord Jesus, I give you my heart my life, everything. And I'm asking you to be my Savior and Lord from this day forward. And Lord, I know because I've asked you, you promised me you would not turn me away. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Let me tell you something. God loves you tonight. He loves you, and I... I, I believe tonight some hearts have been changed, but I want to, one other thing before we dismiss, and I know we're running just a tad long, but I feel this in my heart. Maybe you're here tonight and you're in a business, you're in a place, you're in the work field, you're in the workforce, and you want your light to shine for Jesus. I want you to just raise your hand tonight. I want to pray for you before we leave here. I want my light to shine. I, or maybe you're even in the point of saying, my light hasn't shined, but I want it to. I want you to hold that hand up and reach up toward Jesus tonight. Lord, I pray over every person that's got their hand in this place tonight up. God, I just want to thank you. I pray over every person that's here that, Lord, we will be a people that light will shine in the world, God. That people will say, I bet I know one person that knows Jesus. That guy does because I see it in his life every day when I work with him. God, I pray tonight that when people look at our life and people look at our heart, they will know that we love you by the light that shines through us. He said tonight, Lord, about the city being up on a hill. We don't put a city on a hilltop and put a basket or cover it up or light and cover it up, Lord. We let it shine that all men can see. And I pray tonight, God, that there's many lamps and many lights in this room that are changing this community and this world, God, for your kingdom. I believe one person at a time is how you wanted the plan of salvation to go forward. Person to person, day to day, meeting people every day, being that influence. I bless this people tonight, God, in this room to be earth shakers, Lord, when they go into their business. Lord, that they'll shake their business for the kingdom of God. Lord, they'll shake this earth for the kingdom of God. They'll shake their towns. They'll shake their cities. They'll shake whatever it is they're in. They'll shake their homes, Father God. In the name of Jesus, I thank you, Father, that your spirit will go forth and fill them, Father God. Will the light of Jesus, that you'll fill all of us with your light tonight, Father, and with your power and with your glory, Lord, in Jesus' name. That's what I pray over everyone in this room tonight, that we become the light of the world. You are the light of the world, but may you shine through us, Lord Jesus. May you shine through this group tonight. 
I praise you for my brother that brought such a beautiful message tonight, God. I thank you for Brother Allen, God. I thank you for all the things. I thank for all the things he's done in the past, the missionary work and the stuff to Haiti and different countries. But, God, he spoke, he spoke truth tonight. He spoke your word, and, God, it, it affected me tonight. And I'm, I bet it's affected many in this room. And I thank you for it. And, Father, I pray your blessings upon this group as we go now. Dismiss us tonight with your blessings and your glory. Go with us, and, Father, let us be full of peace. Let us be full of peace and full of your spirit.